Johnson. Um, I met Mama Jinpa in 2017. Um, I changed my menu on me here. That's when I took refuge with Lama Jinpa, it was 2017. <clears throat> and I've been practicing the Dharma for a little while. You won't say that I've gone very far, but I've uh, practiced long enough that maybe it would be of a little interest uh, to people if I talk about where I came from and how it all happened for me. If I can just, I'm using, I'm using Adobe Acrobat and they changed all of my menus. <clears throat> so I'm having, and I do not, don't like that. Uh, it'd be great if the new arrangement were better, but I don't like it better. So apologies for my technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay, well, I was going to make it full screen. I don't think I can pull it off. Uh, try oh. doing command L, and that might make it full screen, Dirk. Yeah, that's what I was doing, thanks, but that didn't work either. I don't know what happened. They changed their commands. Oh, there it went. Now, finally, after the fifth try. Okay. So, get all of the glitches out of the way right here at the beginning, and everything will be fine this um here we go this is a uh this is a nitran altar at a nitran temple in santa monica california uh and it'll become clear why i started with that as things progress so it's been uh it's been 50 years since i first met the dharma so i gotta move pretty quickly here and i got a lot of ground to cover but first, I'm going to start with this uh, lineage prayer from the from the Nyala lineage of uh, Nyala Pema Dunal. May I hereby become completely free from all grasping to a self and from all desire and attachment to the things of this world. May the Bodhisattva's attitude arise in my heart. May I thereby become a mighty protector of each and every living being. May I come to realize all forms and appearances I encounter in this world to be nothing but the play of deity, mantra, and primordial wisdom. And may I, in this very life, attain and manifest the perfect state of Samantabhadra. That was translated by uh, Kempo Gurme Trinley, whom I will also talk about later, and uh, Robert Clark, who recently died, also known as T.T. Dorje. And here we have... I'm going to start with uh, really my road of asceticism. Uh, uh, though I have continued endlessly in a cycle of births and deaths throughout the three world systems, the actions that I have committed have been pointless and unproductive. Yet from amongst all these many countless births, the actions committed in the course of just a single lifetime could have been worthwhile if only I had trained well, pursued the path of unsurpassed enlightenment, and thus attained the genuine final nirvana. It's from the Bardo Total, uh, better known as the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead. Uh, that's the Gurme Dorje translation. So here's the only photographic record of my uh, time on the road, which was uh, from the time I was 15 until I was 23. Uh, but so this is a little late. Uh, this is uh, when I was probably 21, I think. I had ridden a guy asked me to show him how to ride freight trains, which was his big mistake. Uh, but uh, we we wound up in a bed of a pickup truck uh, on a flat car, and well, not on a flat car, on a car carrier, uh, open car carrier, <clears throat> on a freight train that went around Shasta in a, in a snowstorm, and uh, then we pulled into Klamath Falls, Oregon, and uh, found our way into a, a bar that was uh, right by the tracks, and we had just enough money for each of us to have a cup of coffee at the bar. So he was a photographer, though, so he took this photograph of, of me in that bar. I spent most of my uh, adolescent, my, from the age of 15 to 23, I was uh, 
would leave home. I finished high school, by the way. It's not like I didn't do that, but I would leave home, home and uh, even went to college, got, you know, humanity student of the year, <laughs> stuff like that. But I would just take off with a notebook and a denim jacket. I didn't have any money. I never panhandled, never begged for money. The only thing I asked for were rides. Uh, people gave me food. Most of the time I was hungry and I didn't mind because I felt free, sort of, even though I was generally uh, in a lot of emotional pain. And in fact, from the time of about 11 on, I was very suicidal. I, I just uh, often concluded that continuing on was pointless. And so uh, the freedoms and endowments of this precious human life are extremely difficult to obtain. And that's uh, the life without the Dharma is not the precious human life. That's the, the definition of the, it's a human life. Uh, but without the Dharma, it's not a precious human life. Now the uh, Tiantai Buddhists, or Tendai in Japanese, uh, have this concept of the Ichinen San Zen, which is a single moment of life or a single moment of consciousness comprising 3,000 realms, which basically means that in a moment of every moment we have the entire universe with us in us and they also talk about 10 worlds the tibetans talk about six realms the uh, hell hungry ghost animal human ashura which i translated here as demigods and gods those are the six realms uh and then uh the tibetans talk about the, the four four vehicles or the four paths of the Shravakas, Shraf, Pratyaka Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. But the Tendai, which is one of the earliest of the Japanese uh, <clears throat> sects and most influential, I mean Chinese sects and most influential, started in the seventh century. Uh, they talk about the ten worlds being hell, hungry ghost, animal, human, demigod, god, shravakas, protecta buddhas, bodhisattvas, and buddhas, and that all of these are present in every sentient being at all times. That one or another of them dominates, but all ten are always present. Now that I found to be really uh, profound. I've meditated on this for many years, and I found it to be a profound teaching. That's my maternal grandfather, uh, Papa, my beloved Papa, uh, when I was probably about 18 months old. So 1956, maybe, maybe 55, depends how you count it. Um, at the far volunteer fireman's bar in the Heighton, Pennsylvania, uh, getting me ready to join them for beer drinking and having fun. So on one of my uh, trips, my long trip, we took, uh, I had two friends that I would hitchhike with and everybody else I would always wind up telling them to travel by themselves because they couldn't take the hard road that I was willing to take. And one of these people and I uh, left Los Angeles and took three days without food or uh, hardly any water. And the only sleep we got was sitting on the bench of, uh, of an earth mover that gave us a ride from somewhere to somewhere in New Mexico, somewhere up through Santa Fe and into Boulder, Colorado, and where a woman uh, leaving her husband picked us up uh, hitchhiking west. Uh, and she said that I often, that's another thing, I often drove for people. I used to drive, I could drive all night. I grew up doing that anyway as a child. Uh, my parents just would drive all night, all the time, and I would stay up and navigate for them. So I did that a lot. She asked me to. I took the wheel. hadn't slept in three days. Uh, they both fell asleep in the back seat. Car didn't have a radio. I was a smoker, but I didn't have any cigarettes. Uh, 85 degrees in the afternoon, and the middle of Kansas, in the middle of the wheat fields, and I fell asleep and. Uh, we crashed. Everybody else, they didn't get hurt. They were fine. But I uh, wound up with a skull fracture. And you can see this picture here is of, of the facial nerve. So my skull fracture fractured from the temple, the temporal bone up at the top there down through and somewhere along here toward the somewhere in the ear or near the ear fractured the uh, facial nerve, which is why I'm still paralyzed on the left side of my face. And it also damaged my optic nerve and uh, my eardrum. And I was uh, 
three weeks in the hospital in Kansas. My mother came and got me in Kansas and we flew to California in a wheelchair. I was in a wheelchair, not her. And uh, <clears throat> three more weeks in, the, in a uh, private hospital in Thousand Oaks, California. And I had, uh, I, was, I was really out of it. I was mentally, now this all happened just for historical reference. I watched the Watergate hearings from my hospital room in California. They started right when I arrived in California. Uh, so was that 1973, I guess. And a uh, constant headache, nine scale headache, which I had for years. Uh, CNS fluid coming out of my ear for a couple of years. Uh, and <clears throat> my doctor came in after six weeks and he sat by my bed and he said, you know, there's nothing we can do to help you. Uh, you're in really bad shape, but we just don't know anything way to help you. So. But I do have something that might help you. I, I do this practice and I'd, I'd be happy to take you with me to this practice if you'd be willing to go. And so when I got out of the hospital, Dr. Michael Brown started taking me to Nietzsche and Shoshu uh, meetings where we chanted uh, parts of the Lotus Sutra. They chanted that faster, faster, right from the start. And then me, I could hardly even speak at all. My jaw was I just bent up. Uh, my tongue was paralyzed. I uh, had a really hard time uh, trying to do this. This, by the way, is Chinese. They told me it was, yeah, this is uh, the Lotus Sutra in Chinese, not Japanese. So nobody knew what it said, nobody cared. Uh, and we chanted Nam Yoho Renge Ko. And I, I tried, I really tried, and it really helped me. I mean, I, I, this is uh, called a Butsadan and a Gahanzan. That's the way the Soka Gakkai Nichirans do things. Uh, there, there are, by the way, there are 40 registered Nichiren sects in Japan. Nichiren Shoshu, Soka Gakkai is only one of them. It's the one that made a big push into the United States. So that was the, this is all pre-internet and everything. Uh, but I didn't really, uh, didn't really practice very long. I, I, I didn't really believe, I, I don't know. I, it helped me and I knew it helped me, but I just couldn't continue to do it. You know, my karma was pretty, pretty heavy. Um, and so I continued on the road. Uh, first, I, as soon as I got out of the hospital, I worked two factory jobs in succession. Because my parents told me that I was just being lazy. I needed to get a job, so I went and got a job right away. Nobody understood how messed up I was. Even I didn't understand how messed up I was. Until maybe 10 years later, I realized how messed up I had been. Uh, and I still would use Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, though, but I was more inclined to read Walt Whitman and uh, Immanuel Kant and uh, Frederick Nietzsche and so on and so forth. However, I had, uh, as a child, I, I had a hard time with uh, central heating that caused my sinuses to go nuts. And so I, I learned to kind of do this thing for myself where I would relax my attention on, my, on, my, on the air moving through my sinuses. Uh, and I would sit like that. I didn't sit in any particular position to do it, uh, but I would do it for pretty long time at, at a time and my sinuses would clear up and it would make me feel very happy and very comfortable. Basically, I was doing shamatha. Um, eventually, I just uh, bought a one-way ticket to New York City uh, where I didn't know anybody, had $180 in my pocket and was robbed my first day. Uh, after, uh, and I didn't write home, for, I didn't ask anyone for help, I just put up with it. Uh, but after a while, uh, some people, you know, helped me. They they were very kind to me. Uh, I worked my way up to, you know, having a little bit of a job, a little place to live. And I lived right around the corner from Dijam Rinpoche, right around the block. He lived on the next block from me. Uh, Yeshe Nyingpo is his organization. Uh, but a friend of mine had told me that, uh, oh, those guys, those guys, yeah, that's Tibetan Buddhism, but, you know, the guy who runs that thing, he's a heroin addict, don't go over there. So I never, never even went there. <clears throat> and uh, on, his, on his block, on Dujan Rinpoche's block, uh, three guys uh, looking for trouble in New York, coming in from the upper middle class suburbs of New York, 
running around knocking down trash cans and stuff ran into me and we, I wound up on the ground when I'm kicking me in the head and I got another skull fracture. Uh, so <laughs> and the doctor didn't believe me that I had a skull fracture because I could talk. <clears throat> and at that time, it wasn't nearly as bad. So I, I got out of the hospital in a week. And I'm sorry if I'm going on too long. I'm trying to be quick here. I got out of the hospital in about a week and sat in Union Square Park. Uh, reading Ezra Pound's cantos, trying to get my focus back, went back and forth between that and my self-invented shamatha meditation. And this uh, young Japanese woman walked up to me and said, excuse me, have you ever heard of Namyoho Renge Kyo? Well, how about that? You know, two skull fractures, two times I heard of Namyoho Renge Kyo. So I started practicing with uh, Soka Gakkai again. And uh, what they Asked you to do is twice a year to go out and do shakabuku, which is what she was doing, where they walk up and ask people. Shakabuku literally means to break and subdue. So it's a sudden, they consider it a sudden path to enlightenment. So they're waking you up. It said that Nichiren stood himself uh, on the corner. It was one of those big, um, by the way, I'm joining you from Gan from Odiana today, which is now the Swat Valley in Pakistan. Uh, he would stand on street corners with one of those medieval bronze pots over his head and hit it with a stick, saying, doing shakabuku, which, hitting you over the head to get your attention. So I think a, skull, a couple of skull fractures kind of uh, set that up for me. And that's really how I met. This is really, really met the Dharma. I did meet it the first time when I was 19, 50 years ago. Uh, but this is when I, I really, really practiced diligently uh, every day. I read Nitrin. Uh, I was really into it. But and 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 I improved really rapidly. My concept, my, my whole life started changing. Uh, I I improved really rapidly. But the but the regimentation of the Soka Gakkai was just something I just couldn't I just couldn't deal with it. So I kept practicing. And I, I looked for other Nietzsche insects, but, you know, pre-World Wide Web, it's pretty hard to find stuff like that. And I decided to go back to Nietzsche's roots and to go to Tendai, to do Tendai Buddhism, or Tiantai, which is the, the Chinese. But once again, you know, there was almost nothing. There was almost nothing about Tiantai, about Tendai. Couldn't find anything. New York Public Library, one of the great libraries, public libraries of the world, couldn't find much. So I kept going to the bookstores where I spent most of my time and most of my money. Uh, and I kept seeing all this Tibetan stuff around. I'd gone to uh, one of uh, Chogyam Trungpa's uh, uh, centers. Uh, I, I was leery of it because I knew Chogyam Trungpa was a drunk and I didn't want a drunken teacher. And uh, then I went to his centers and I, I have to tell you, I thought the people that I met there were a bunch of arrogant assholes. So I didn't go back to that. Went into a zen temple and sat down i said so can you tell me what this is about they said just sit there and shut up and it'll all come to you and i said well fuck you and i left um so this is my you know so i find finally found the tibetan book of living and dying i said well okay i'll i'll, I'll read this and well i kind of fell in love with it i still think it's a masterpiece despite sogi rinpoche's problems and i started uh chanting Oma Hung. Vajra Guru Padma Siddhi Hun and uh, the Vajrasattva Mantra, walking around, chanting it, sitting at home, chanting it, chanting it, chanting it, visualizing Guru Rinpoche. But I, I figure I, I, if, I would never, would, I would never be able to meet a Tibetan Lama. Where, the, where would I meet a Tibetan Lama? And then I was on a business trip, but I was still, you know, still wavering. I'm not sure what I should do. I was on a business trip. I went to San Francisco. I bought this two-volume Bodhicharya Vitara set uh, with the commentary from the Panjika. Actually, it's a not really a translation of it, but it's a commentary based on the Panjika. And I read that in the airport and on the plane. By the time I landed in San, in back in uh, at Newark Airport, uh, I was. Uh, certain that this was the buddhist path was my path and the very next day i had i was flying always i used to always get sick when i flew not only did i get sick but i got an impacted tooth uh but somehow i found 
this Tibetan Lama was giving an empowerment, and stumbled into this empowerment. Uh, very hard for me to do. Somehow I did it. And Nyosho uh, Kempo, I can still just think of him. And that's the only time I met him. I can just. So that was the Guru Rinpoche empowerment. And then I, I was practicing a lot with uh, Rigpa. Uh, I, I went to the, on the retreats. I sat, did a lot of sitting. Uh, I was very intensively trying to get, practice. Uh, but I, I, it wasn't, Rigpa wasn't really for me. And uh, I found a group that was practicing under uh, the auspices of Chagda Tulka Rinpoche, who uh, uh, Robert Newman was the man's name who led the group. We practiced in his apartment in New York City. Uh, and we practiced the Dijim Tursar Nundro, and we practiced uh, uh, the English uh, short, brief red Tara practice that Jagni Rinpoche taught. And not very long after that, I don't know, two months, a couple of months, three months, four months, some, I don't remember how long. Uh, but Chagda Rinpoche came to New York City, and uh, Robert Newman was always very able, free, felt free to talk to the Lamas. Uh, he convinced Rinpoche to give us each a uh, one-on-one 15-minute interview. And there were probably, I don't know, somewhere between 20 and 30 people, maybe 25, 26 people. Uh, and I was last because I was the new guy. Um, so by the time, by the time it was my turn to meet Rinpoche, he 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 was kind of at the end of his rope, you know. Who knows what kind of BS he had to listen to this time, all that time. Um, so I walk in, and he he could check the room. So this is Nyoshal Kempo on on the left, and check the room on the right. One of my favorite pictures. Uh, he says he check the room could be really fierce. I mean, he could be fierce. Like we were at one thing, and this guy says. He, Rinpoche said, we're going to practice this. And the guy said, shouldn't you give us the empowerment first? He said, I just did. <laughs> it's very, it could be really fierce. And so I walk in and he says, sharp, make it sharp. And I, I, I just, I started, I started talking really fast and crying, telling him what I, you know, what I was trying to do and who I was trying to, so, so Rinpoche's students told, senior students told me I should do this. And Robert Newman told me I should do this. And I didn't know what to do. And he goes, no. So I stop and I look at him and he goes, you have Vajrasattva empowerment. I said, no. He said, oh. Mm. Mm. You have Chinrezi empowerment? He said, no. Mm. He's becoming more and more concerned. Tara, you have Tara empowerment? No. Oh. Mm. He goes into thought. I said, Guru Rinpoche empowerment. He said, oh, who? I said, Nyosho Kempa Rinpoche. Oh, and he he started talking. He just started talking really, 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 really fast. Uh, he gave me the transmission of the Dijim Tursar Nundro with the instructions for practicing it. And then he gave me Dzogchen pointing out instructions. Now he... His wife, Jane, was standing there with him. And uh, she was always there because she was there or Lama, now Lama Tsering Everest, was that would be there or a couple of other people because nobody, people couldn't understand Chagdid Rinpoche when he talked. He talked, he, he could talk pretty fast, but he, he, his syntax was very strange. So people wouldn't understand him. I understood every sing, I understood every word. So that's what uh, Jane looked at me and she said, did you? Did you understand that? And I said, "Oh yeah." She said, "That's she. She was. She couldn't believe it." And I, and I understood that, but I did. There's no question. I had this just powerful experience of connection with uh, Chagad Rinpoche. I could just understand what he said. Uh, I could do that with uh, Kempo Girme too. I could even understand sometimes Kempo when he talked in Tibetan. I had no idea what he was saying in Tibetan. And then, of course, I said to him. Uh, would you accept me as your student? He said, of course. Which, which in, if you translate Chagdurimpeche, it means, what are you, an idiot? I, isn't it obvious I've accepted you as your student? Um, 
the next day, here's a picture from the next day. This is uh, taken on a four by five, originally taken in black and white of uh, Troma Nagma empowerment. There are only, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 prints made on that. I'm really grateful to have it. So then, you know, I moved to San Francisco too, and I met Rinpoche many times, I've seen him several times. I met him a lot of times and took a lot of teachings and empowerments from him. And, uh, when he and but he, but he did move to Brazil and created a big center there. And when he passed away into final nirvana, or like as I like to say, when he left us to go to Chamara, uh, I was a little bit adrift again. Uh, but in San Francisco it was Gautreaux Rinpoche, and at that time uh, Alan Wallace was his translator. So I attended quite a few teachings with uh, Gyatro Rinpoche and Alan Wallace translating. Uh, one time, one time uh, Gyatro Rinpoche said, people ask me, Lama, Lama, how should I be? And he pointed at Alan Wallace and he said, you be like him. Um, but I didn't really connect with that Sangha. I didn't, I, I, I loved it. I liked the people, but I just, I didn't feel at home there. I just didn't feel at home there. Uh, and do the kindness though of Gautra Rinpoche, then Pina Rinpoche started coming to San Francisco to the Bay Area, mostly in Berkeley, once in San Jose. Um, and I was took refuge the first time I took uh, actually took refuge that didn't include a Vajrayana empowerment was with uh, Pema Norbu Rinpoche, who at the time was the supreme head of the Nyingma, and he is the lineage holder of the Palyul lineage of. Nyingma. And he gave me the name Tukton Lodro. And I also took Bodhisattva vows from him. And uh, he gave, one day he gave us the oral trans, in San Jose, he gives the oral transmission for all of the Nyingma Nundros, which was a stack of texts about two and a half feet high. He just read them at high speed all day in this really hot day in a small church. Uh, and I also, he also gave us Gawa Jatsu and Shitro empowerments. During the Gawa Jatsu, now, you know, I met him, I had a one-on-one -on -one with him, and, and I, I, I have tremendous respect for him, but I didn't feel that kind of, same kind of connection I have to Chagatam. Uh, at the Gawa Jatsu empowerment, he starts, he, you know, we're talking about this high empowerment, he's got like 15 monks with him, he's got a couple of Kempos with him, uh, and... Uh, you know, it's a very high empowerment. And the, we're in this Episcopal church off College Avenue in Berkeley and doors fling open and this monk walks in. He can, walks in like he owns the place. He just walks in. Peter Rinpoche stops. The whole place just was like looking at him like, who's this guy, you know? And he walks up and he walks up to Peter Rinpoche and he, he does three prostrations. And then he walks up and they talk for like, I don't know. It was probably only two or three minutes, but it seemed longer. Uh, and then then he goes over and the the Kempo on, that you see on the right here is uh, Kempo uh, Sewang Jatso, who, whom I love also. But uh, so this is Kempo Gurme Trinley uh, on, on the left there. He walks up and Kempo Sewang Jatso is the head Kempo of the Palio lineage, but he moves over, gives, uh, gives this guy a seat and uh, at the head of the table basically. So, uh, after the empowerment, you know, this guy, this guy was walking around. I walked up to him, and all, all of my friends couldn't believe that I did this. They were telling me, they were telling me not to. I walked up to him and I said, uh, "What are you? Some, you some kind of big shot or something?" And he, he just, he just laughed uproariously. He thought that was the funniest thing that he had ever heard. And he says, "You give me number. You give me number." And so he was asked. So I gave him my phone number. Next day he called me. So you come, you come, you come my place. So I go, went to his place. After that, man, I was under Kempo Girme Trinley's uh, command, and so this is him doing trauma nundro. I mean trauma chud trauma nundro. Well, there is a trauma nundro, but uh, we were very close. He mostly needled me, made fun of me for being a vegetarian, pushed my buttons, got me. I yelled at him sometimes. And he would just laugh when I yelled at him. Or he would go, oh, no, no, no. Uh, and then 
so he he also gave me the two highest compliments I ever received. The first was you, you compa, like me, you compa. That's how Kempa talked. Right? When I when I talk, when I imitate him like that, I'm not making fun of him. I'm and uh, then the other it's calling me a compa, saying I was just like him was something. And then and then when I took refuge with him, he gave me his name. Gourmet Trinley, Gourmet Tinley, his, his the spelling of his name was never settled. Sometimes it's Gourmet, sometimes it's Gourmet, sometimes it's Trinley, sometimes it's Tinley. But and we kept a center for him on hate in the hate in San Francisco uh, at a bookstore. The guy went out of business, and I took over the lease. And uh, we, I went there every day after work and held practice. Uh, uh, Dacian Lingpa's Green Tara mostly and the shower of blessings and then on sundays uh kempa would come and we would practice and he would teach mostly we would practice but he would also teach uh from nine in the morning until 10 o'clock at night every week uh trauma should we did green tara we did a lot of soap we, we and there were usually no more than five of us sometimes there would, i think the most we ever had was like 12 people was always giving me a hard time not that i wasn't bringing enough people but... and then uh uh rinpoche because because he was kempo rinpoche was such he was tireless he wouldn't stop he just wouldn't stop and he went to india he went to Bodh Gaya, and he wouldn't stop and he went into a diabetic coma and died there and uh I, we didn't really have a song huh? So once again, no teacher, no song. Huh? I started practicing on my own. Um, of course, I always thought of Chakad Rinpoche and Kempo and Yosha Kempo. Uh, I was living now. I was the, had moved to Willits, uh, California, Mendocino County. And in Will in Mendocino County, there's a monastery of the Thai forest uh, Theravada tradition uh, lineage of Ajahn Cha. And so I started going there and practicing with the monks and the lay people there. This is actually there. This is a picture. The other, this picture, they're nestled in the Santa Monica, in, in the mountains there, uh, the coastal mountains in Mendocino County. So they've had some real issues with fire in recent years. But the monastery is still there. Um, these, this is actually the monks there. Uh, started, uh, so this was a new intensive period of practice uh, for a couple of years. I practiced with these monks and um, we did a, a, a lunar lunar upasaka practice every week. Uh, I won't go into the details. It was a long practice of basically 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. we practiced. Uh, and I practiced pretty intensively. Well, their path, the sitting meditation path, uh, on my own, and then uh, this is this is a AI generated image of a of a of a Viking having a nervous breakdown. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm half Norwegian. That's a joke. But uh, anyway, I really did love the community and the practice, but I still I didn't have that heart connection with anybody. Ajahn Pasano, great respect for him, uh, great respect for these monks, great respect for their teachings and their lineage, all of it. Um, but I, I was pretty isolated and I was practicing really intensively and I pretty much had a nervous breakdown. I mean, I just completely fell apart. I hadn't, con now mind you, I, I, I was suicidal until I met Chagad Rinpoche. And the day I met Chagda Rinpoche, I was never suicidal again. And so I completely broke down, but I still didn't become suicidal. Now, I, I thought about becoming a monk with them, but I, I just, and I couldn't go to them and ask them for support. So I just, I actually, I quit practicing. That's what I did. And then after a little while, after a while of not practicing, I, I went back to doing Nundro and my Vajrayana practices. And uh, then started looking for a Tibetan teacher again, and we moved to Sacramento. And uh, this is Lama Tony. Um, am I going on too long? Did I lose track of time? I'm so sorry. 
anyway, so this is Tony Duff. Tony told me, oh, those uh, to, those uh, Galugpa lineage llamas, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna really make you start over at the beginning, <laughs> and you're gonna have a rough time, and you're not gonna like it. And so I, I didn't go to the temple for three years, and then after three years, uh, I said, well, fine, I'll start over. I just, I need, I need a, I need a teacher, and I met Patty and Susan Farrar, and. I said, wow, these people are wonderful. Their Lama must be wonderful too. And then I met Lama Yeshe Jinpa and took refuge with him. And once again, there we go. Heart connection again. So he gave me the name Yeshe Sanglam, and uh, that means wisdom of the secret path. And that's it. I'll end here. And I do apologize for going on so long. I timed it before and it didn't take as long. So, uh, any comments or questions or Lama says complaints? Yeah. Hey, Dirk. I got one right off the bat for you. Um, how has your connection or your practice changed since you've moved to Pennsylvania away from Sangha? No. Dirk? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm did thinking. you hear that? I did hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, that's, that's a, I'm still, uh, I've just relived a bunch of stuff with my other, with my, my three llamas, my four llamas. Um, well, you know, pretty much it's the same. I, I talked to I talked to Lama, we could call him Lama Rinpoche, uh, quite 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 you know pretty often one on one, and uh, uh, I still have a connection to you to the Sangha. But w one thing that has changed is that there are a lot of new people that I don't know, um, which is partially why I did this today is because uh, maybe it'll be easier for me to meet some of the new people if I just talk about who I am a little bit. Uh, I found this hard to do, harder to do than I be much easier. I could talk for I could talk for an hour about just the title Namasangiti much easier. But uh, So it's changed that I don't, you know, I, I miss the the one, I miss the uh, live, the live presence of people. I'm, I'm, uh, Zoom, Zoom is uh, quickly becoming less friendly to me as a practice venue. So what I really am supposed to do is develop uh, a, a group here, and I haven't done that yet, so. That's that's something that I I need to work on and something Lama has told me to work on. So uh, we'll do that and then we'll make sure everybody meets everybody at some. I don't I know I didn't really answer your question, but <laughs> no, you did. I you know I miss having you around also. So I think someone else has a question. Yes. On. Okay. Um. Earlier in the in your talk, you mentioned there's um, this concept that ten identities are present at any time in a person, and one of them's dominant, and one of them's called hungry ghost. And I guess I just wondered, like, why is it specifically a hungry ghost? Well, that's usually how it's translated. It's uh, the 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 actual term is preta. Uh, so you got the hell hell realms. The hell realms, of course, in Buddhism are temporary, uh, like all all other realms. Uh, they last a long time, but they're temporary. Um, the Preta realm is a realm of not being able to be satisfied. The hell realm is this this realm of uh, anguish, just you know, suffering, physical torm of torment. The Preta realm is a realm of having 
being really desirous and not being able to satisfy your desires. It's a realm of grave, just just endless, just relentless craving. And so that's why they're called hungry ghosts is because they're they're always, one of the depictions of the pretas is that they've got really big stomachs and really tiny, tiny throats and tiny mouths that they can't take enough food in. So that's 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 why the, the pretas are sometimes translated as hungry ghosts. Hi, Dirk. I'm Greg. Hi, Greg. I can't see you. I can only see your bottom half. But <laughs> okay. uh, where would I go if I want to be seen? You could actually just sit up. I could probably see you. Yeah, now I can see you. <laughs> six foot three. I beg your pardon? I'm six foot three. Ah, well, I'm only six two, so. Anyone else? Hey, Dirk, it's Susan. Hi, Susan. How are you doing? Pretty well. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Oh, I'm doing great. Yeah, Good. me and Molly are just happy as little clams. <laughs> yeah, we have a new little kitten, but it's caused all kinds of oh, issues yeah. here with the old one of the older cats. One of the older cats loves her. The other older cat is very unhappy. So, <laughs> you're in Pennsylvania. Tell us why you moved to Pennsylvania in particular, or you know, like like your and how you like it there. The weather's really different and. You didn't like the weather here and you know just well some of it just had to do with money um but but it became pennsylvania uh because partially because this this you know i grew up without a hometown i grew up my father worked on the apollo project uh, guidance computer we followed the prototype of that computer all over the country so i never lived i never went to the same uh school for two years until i was uh in junior high, and then, uh, and even then, I it went. I went to two junior highs, and I went to uh, two high schools. So, uh, Pennsylvania, though, is where my mother grew up in the height. And I showed you the picture of my grandfather with me as a as a infant uh, with beer in front of me in the height in Pennsylvania. And we were we were looking all over. We we started all you know. We said, well, maybe we could move. Over, maybe we should move over to. Uh, the coast, you know, in California, maybe we could go to Eureka, but every, everything was just beyond our, our, our means. We couldn't afford any place. Uh, so we said, oh, how about Oregon? We, we even, we went on trips. We went up to Oregon. We looked at Washington. We thought we wanted to go on the peninsula. We looked, And I kept saying, well, you know, how about the height in Pennsylvania? You know, I mean, look, you can get a house for $89,000 in the height in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we started looking, and finally Julie said, "Yeah, let's let's look there." You know, we, we, so we 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 found a house, a 1,500 square foot, two story house with a an attic that works as an office and a small yard for eighty nine thousand dollars. You know, and this is where we came. Yeah, I remember when you. Yeah, you got the house sight unseen, right? Yep, we did it on the internet. It was during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. I there are things that we would have not gotten the price knocked down farther if we had actually come here, because there are things that the inspect that you know we didn't know about, yeah. and we could have done that. But but we're we're happy. We're we're good. Uh, we we both really like it here. So, and to me, this is home, like home. The Northeast is home. I spent 17 years in New York City. Uh, I I I went to kindergarten in Appalachia, New York, which is basically Binghamton, New York. That's where my brother and my sister were born. Uh, we always spent a lot of time in Lehigh and Weisport, Pennsylvania, Bowmanstown, Palmerton, all these little towns around. And now I'm in Tamaqua, which is a little, little outside of that. But the Steigerwald family, like we told the realtor, she goes, oh, well, where are you guys from? I said, well, I'm a Steigerwald. She goes, oh, yeah, there are loads of those around. You know, the Steigerwald family has been here since 1741. So <laughs> it's they, even my neighbor went to a Steigerwald reunion and she's not a Steigerwald and she lives in a different county. But she said, wow, they're the most amazing things. They got, you know, they big cookouts and party. They play all played baseball, you know, so, you know so it really, this is time to me. That's the thing. It's home. Yeah. 
So yeah, you kind of landed someplace. That's very cool. After all that vagabonding, right? Yeah. 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 Well, New York City felt like home too. Actually, honestly, after after three years, it took three years, but after three years, New York City felt like home. But it was just so hard to live there. <laughs> so you uh, so say a little bit about the Vajrasattva practice that you do. With uh, oh. right. I'm sorry. You, are you still doing Vajrasattva? I oh yeah I I, I well I, I mostly do Vajrasattva in context of the Dutum Trusar Nandra. But when you do you still do it the lion's roar in the evening? Oh you oh you're talking about the lunar practice? No, I, I we stopped doing that because nobody was coming. Okay, sorry. I guess you could So if there was no there was no need for it, I can practice it by myself uh, without sitting at a computer. Well, say something about the Vajrasattva practice cuz we did do it for so long. Oh, uh, well that one that one it's it, it actually I have to admit that I sort of made that practice up. Um but I I did it based on Yoshal Kempo. Yosho Kempo, uh, he would he he would he would say, "Okay, now we're going to practice," and everybody'd sit up straight and go, "Just relax, just relax." Uh, and 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 he would just start doing the Vajrasattva mantra. He would do the Vajrasattva mantra maybe three times, maybe seven times, and then just stop. And everybody would just sit, but it was amazing. Amazing, you know. Uh, so I said, "Well, I don't want. I'm not Yosho Kampa Rinpoche, so I would like to do this, but I don't want to always be the one leading it. I don't want to always be the one doing the mantra." So uh, we we did it in the temple for three years, I think, two years maybe, before I moved here. Um, so I said, well, you know, instead of me being the one who just decides when that starts, we should just all be, we're doing pure practice. So let's all just be the one, let's all just be the leader. So anybody practicing could just say, uh, start doing the mantra. So what we would do is I would start it. We would do the mantra seven times. For, we would do, of course, some opening prayers and do the mantra seven times together. I would lead the first mantra. Um, and then we would just sit until someone felt the need. The instructions were when discursive thinking starts to return, start saying, you know, say, start saying the mantra and everybody will chant along with you. And then from then on, we all did it three times. So the next person, we could sit there for, we could sit there the whole time. If nobody said the mantra, that'd be fine. Or we can, we, sometimes we did the mantra every five minutes. Um, just depended on the people who were there, how they were feeling, you know, how the practice was going for people. But like that, it's very flexible. It's basically a sitting, it's, it's a Dzogchen style sitting meditation. That's what it really is. It could be shamatha, it could be Dzogchen, it could be Mahamudra, it could be whatever, however, you're, whatever level you're practicing on, it, it, it can be. And I, I found it wonderful. And a lot of people I know when we did it live together in the temple, I really liked it too. Uh, now there's also another Vajrasattva practice that Doug, Doug and I, I used to go to Doug's house who's sitting next to you. And uh, we practiced, just he and I practiced uh, Vajrasattva Sadhana that uh, Lama Jinpa put together. Uh, and we, oh, during COVID and, and then, there were a couple of people practice with us a little bit. Uh, uh, James Myers practiced with us for a little while. Uh, and then <clears throat> uh, then COVID happened and we're doing everything online and Doug and I opened it up. And that's how we met. We met JD that way, uh, Jen that way, practicing that Vajrasattva Sadhana. That's a, that's a standard, kind of a standard Vajrayana Sadhana. Vajrayana practice. So they're the two. Vajrayana is, uh, Vajrasap is very important to me, though. I mean, the Shitro, I don't know if you know, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead comes from the Guya Garba Tantra, which is uh, generally part of a larger thing called the Shitro, uh, which is the 100 Peaceful and Wrathful Deities. But the but the practice when you when you do the practice that you do with that is is a Vajrasat, you you 
you, you you're doing a basically a Vajrasattva practice as as including all of the hundred peaceful and wrathful deities. So Vajrasattva is really deeply uh, in 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 my in my practice. Yeah. Thank you, Dirk. Um, are there any other questions, maybe online, comments, complaints? I don't know. Hey, Dirk, you want to wrap this up or do you want to give us sure. some uh, parting words first? Parting words? Or party uh, words? I don't know. <laughs> well, I had some very nice uh, comments uh, in chat to directly some to me, some of them. Uh, so I want to acknowledge those since I can't really do chat right now. <clears throat> I don't really have any parting words, except that uh, I believe that if you uh, uh, sincerely uh, try to practice more, that you'll wind up being happier. <laughs> And 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 that things will uh, also. I, I don't want to make a connection. You know, it's like then. Okay, neat, I've had so many arguments with people about the, about Nichiren, which I don't I don't practice it. I mean, every now and then I'll do I'll do uh, what they call Gangyo, every just to keep in touch. But and every now and then I like to read some Nichiren too. They got a fabulous website, in fact. Um, but when when people were people you would meet in the nature and practices they would come in they come in most of them were really desperate people because uh you know the people go out to meet people on the street and the only people that, that are going to talk to them are people who are in really bad shape really kind of bad shape you know one way or another either they're living in poverty or they're living in danger or they're sick or whatever they got really got bad things going on for them and uh people would tell them uh Okay, well, you know, you need you need a you need a car you need a car you you know so chant for a car you need an apartment chant for an apartment you need a job chant for a job you need this you know you, you need medicine chant for medicine you need money chant for money and people would always tell me well you know those Nietzschean people they're all so materialistic they tell everybody to go after all this materialistic stuff and blah 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 yeah well look you know. Uh, this is this is a, a practice foundationed in the Lotus Sutra, skillful means. This is the this is the overarching intent of this practice. You 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 need the the, the monks at the monastery at Abhayagira Monastery constantly talked about the the uh, the requisites, the requisites: food, clothing, shelter, medicine. If you don't have those requisites. You can't really practice. So if people need things, you know, there's nothing wrong with trying to get them. And 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 furthermore, if you do come in and you're all materialistic and you want to get a Rolls Royce and you chant for a Rolls Royce, which you don't need, nobody needs a Rolls Royce, but you chant for the Rolls Royce, you'll get it. You will get it. You know, you focus your mind like that with the power of these of this practice, you will get that Rolls Royce. And guess what you'll realize? That the Rolls Royce didn't make you happy. So anyway, I I, I so I defend Nietzschean. <laughs> I'm a Vajrayana practitioner. Nietzschean saved my life. You know, they they saved my life, really, and they led me. They led me to here. It, it, it led me here. It's it skillful means, expedient means. So anyway, those are my party words <laughs> since I since I had to have some. <laughs> Thanks, Dirk. Um, can we get maybe a dedication if you're ready? I'm ready. Um, Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel, Bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi Tenzin Jato, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. 
May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, the great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. So thank you for uh, putting up with me for this hour or so. And I hope to see you in person sometime soon. It's always great to hear from you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi Om Araya Pazaya Nayindi